Hi there. Well, last week, what a victory, what a climax to see the city of Jerusalem saved by God without the people in the city needing to do a thing. What a victory, what an answer to prayer. And our central character, Hezekiah, well, we haven't heard the last of him yet. There's a little bit more information to hear about him before this whole book moves into a completely new section. So, this may seem like a bit of an anticlimax, what we're going to look at at first glance, but I know that you will not be underwhelmed by the content of the next chapters that we're going to see today. So, I'm Andrew, one of the pastors of the Living Room Church. Welcome to Online Church. Well, the chapters that we are looking at today actually take place before the victory and the triumph of chapters 36 and 37. So you're going to need to go to chapter 38. And why does it happen that there's this difference in the chronological order? Why has Isaiah chosen to put the order the way he has? Well, I think it's because in chapters 36 and 37, he's finishing off this incredible story of who are you putting your trust in or what are you putting your trust in and so we've had this incredible culmination but actually moving on now to the story that we're going to see today and find out what Hezekiah got up to it's setting us up for what the last part of this amazing book of Isaiah is meant to be so you're going to find that Assyria will hardly going to mention from now on, and Babylon is going to be the one who's going to be mentioned so many more times as we move on into the future. But this is an amazing king. Hezekiah has been incredible. He's taught us so much, hasn't he? He's done some good things. He's not without his faults. He prays um, for deliverance, and really that's a model for us, isn't it? But as we see in these chapters, as we will see in these chapters, Hezekiah is a good king, but he He's not what we need. We don't need some good but pretty flawed human king. It's not the best for us, great as they can be. So let's unpack our passage for today. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 38. And let's just read the first eight verses, shall we? In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die, you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Please, O Lord, remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, go and say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and will defend this city. That's how we know that chapters 36 and 37 happened after these chapters. This shall be a sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has promised. Behold, I will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz turn back ten steps. So the sun turned back the dial, the ten steps by which it had declined. Great verses. You know, you really have to feel for Hezekiah here. Uh, he's finding out that he's probably going to die. Now, I wonder how any of us might react. Uh, Hezekiah, he prays and he wept. We can see that. And um, that probably would be my reaction too, to be brutally honest. Contemplating death is not easy. Uh, and I'm sure a few, very few of us have ever had to think about that. Maybe some watching have had to contemplate that as they've had some bad news. Well, what's really sure from what we see from Hezekiah is that he does not want to die. He does whatever he can to make sure that he will live. Um, his reaction is turning to the wall. I mean, obviously, he's just so upset he doesn't want Isaiah to see. He's weeping bitterly, completely understandable. But what does he pray? That's the interesting thing. What might you pray if you find out that you didn't have long to live? 
Now, just stopping here for a moment, before we look at what he does say, have you ever shot up that quick prayer for help because you feel in utter danger? Maybe for yourself, maybe even for somebody else. What would you have said? Well, let's see what Hezekiah prays. And so we have that in verse three. Please, O Lord, remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. Now, Hezekiah makes this huge appeal to God, of course. And as we know already, Hezekiah has removed the false areas of worship on the high places, as they're called. Um, He has removed these worship centers from across the land. And if you want to read any more about the reign of King Hezekiah, you'll find a lot of what's written here in Isaiah and some more information in 2 Kings and specifically chapter 18 on, you can find out things about Hezekiah. He's described as somebody who held fast to the Lord. In fact, it says that there was none liking him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. Now he is as good as the kings get in this land of Judah. Now that's quite a reputation. He is a good guy. But it is to this reputation that he appeals to God. He's focused on his own personal integrity. The mention of his wholeheartedness here that he says, it does hark back to David, who was wholeheartedly serving the Lord, meaning that he wasn't interested in any other false gods. He only had this one God, the Lord, as his God. Now, Amazingly, God answers. Now, sometimes I think God answers our prayer, even though they're not that good. And even though we don't pray in a very good way, but he answers our prayers. And Isaiah has this message for him from the Lord, from the God of David, your father. Now, that's promised language because, of course, way back in 2 Samuel, God had promised to David that he would always have a successor on his throne and that the throne would be eternal. Now, David didn't understand. Hezekiah wouldn't have understood exactly what that meant. We do as Christians a wee bit more. But it is this promise language that God enters into. So God's incredible mercy seems more to do with God's faithfulness to David than it does because of Hezekiah's appeal to how good he is. Now, that's a lesson to us. When we pray, Um, God doesn't listen to us simply because we might appeal to our own goodness. Lord, look at all the good things I've done. Lord, look at how I have obeyed you this past week. Look at how much of an effort I've been trying to make. Surely you need to answer my prayer and give me what I want now. Um, I just remember somebody um, a long time ago at this church, he's not part of the church anymore, just saying that they were going for a job interview and they'd had the best quiet times, the best Bible and prayer times for that past week than they'd had in a long time because they really wanted that job. And I remember saying to this person, God doesn't owe you simply because you think you've done a really good job this past week. It's a real mistake for us to think that God owes us because we've tried to be faithful or obedient when we pray. Jesus taught us to pray and he said, your will be done. Jesus, when he was in the garden, um, he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. We've been taught to pray in Jesus' name. In other words, we want the name of Jesus to be high and lifted up not our own values and our own wishes. It's the gracious and merciful act of God that delivers Hezekiah out of this horrendous situation that he's found himself in. And he's given another 15 years of life, verse 6 there. Um, I will deliver you and the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and defend this city. That's just to show that what happens in 36 and 37 is yet to happen in his life. This is an incredible thing for him to see that would give him confidence to pray to God when the really hard time comes for the city. But as part of this answer to his personal dilemma, we have another miraculous answer. Uh, The sun moves. Now, the dial of Ahaz apparently was a set of steps, and so it was useful to see where the shadow would be on these steps in order to know basically what time of the day it was. Um, So 
here's something quite interesting. In, in chapters 36 and 37, it was by the washer's pool, um, on the, the upper pool of the washer's field, that Ahaz had this message from God. That was back in chapter 7. But also in chapter 7, Ahaz was given a sign. He didn't want the sign, but he was given a sign. Here, um, we're finding out that Hezekiah is going to be given a sign, and he does want this sign. And we find that farther on at the end, actually, of verse 21 it is, that we see that he asks what the sign might be. Um, but Ahaz was given the sign of Emmanuel, and here we have this incredible display of the Creator over his creation. And now there might be some of you listening to this thinking, well, I just don't believe the Bible. How can you believe that all of a sudden the sun moved or something or the earth moved or something and, and the shadow moved back in time? How can you believe that? Well, isn't it interesting how, how easy it seems to be for us to think that God could add 15 years to somebody's life and yet not do something like this? Um, I think both are pretty hard to do and both depend on God being an amazing creator in charge of his creation. He rules over what he created. So I don't think we should have too much of a problem with this or let this hold us back from what we see farther on. So let's move from the dilemma on into deliverance. Let's find out what happened. Let's read the next verses, 9 uh, through to the end of 18. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. I said, in the middle of my days, I must depart. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living. I shall look on man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My dwelling is plucked up and removed from me like a shepherd's tent, like a weaver. I have rolled up my life. He cuts me off from the loom from day to night. You bring me to an end. I calmed myself until morning. Like a lion, he breaks all my bones. From day to night, you bring me to, the, to an end. Like a swallow or a crane, I chirp. I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary with looking upward. Oh Lord, I am oppressed. Be my pledge of safety. For what shall I say? For he has spoken to me. And he himself has done it. I walk slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these is the life of my spirit. O oh, restore me to health and make me live. Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. But in love you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not hope in your faithfulness. Now, this is a record, of course, of what King Hezekiah said. It's a writing of King Hezekiah of Judah. So it's been preserved for us. And in it, we can just see pain and we can see utter rawness of his emotion. He feels that he isn't old enough to die. He's far too young to be dying and that his death would have been untimely. He feels fragile like a tent. Um, he feels feeble um, that the pattern of his life on this loom, of the weaver's, weaver's loom, has just been ripped off and cut off um, with great strength. Like a lion, he's overpowered. God is ending his life. He feels helpless, helpless and feeble like a bird, and its cries are just pathetic. It's really poetic, but my, it's real descriptive language. Hezekiah is most likely only about 39 years old and most likely highly educated, so we can expect this language to be really ornate and poetic as it is. He feels great pain, great pain, and wants to live. But it's in verse 17 that he recognises that, well, this comes from God. Uh, he knows that this illness has been for his welfare. This is to do him some good, is to help him to think clearly. Um, God knows his heart. And through this trial, God has a hold of Hezekiah's heart. Tough times really do that, don't they? They, they allow God to get a hold of your heart. Um, so he knows that his sins are forgiven. We find that, that out in the verses. But also, 
we find out that his knowledge of the afterlife is really limited. Um, he talks about Sheol. He thinks that this basically death is the end and there's nothing else beyond death to be able to celebrate God. There's no hope or possibility of hope beyond the grave. Now, of course, we know differently because we know uh, that the grave is just time for judgment. And after judgment, um, you can be separated from God or you get life with God. And Jesus, of course, has passed through death and he has come back to give us hope, to tell us to keep going um, and that there is life beyond this grave, which Hezekiah just doesn't really have as he talks through this. And it takes more of the Bible to expand and show us exactly uh, what is beyond the grave. But read to me these next amazing verses. This is verses 19, 20, and 21. This is all about devotion. The living, the living, he thanks you as I do this day. The Father makes known to the children your faithfulness. The Lord will save me and we will play my music on stringed instruments all the days of our lives at the house of the Lord. Now Isaiah had said, let them take a cake of figs and apply it to the boil that he may recover. Hezekiah also had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? And that's the end of 22, apologies. Now, if I'm understanding Hezekiah correctly, I think there are three things that he's promising. Number one is family devotion. Did you see that in verse 18? He is going to model faithfulness to his children when they come. Now, um, he's going to teach his children how faithful God is. Now, is that your priority? How might you be doing that? How might you be showing faith to the next generation or to your own children? Um, are you showing them that you depend on God? Are you displaying to them that uh, you feel that God needs to be a priority in your life? You see, he is promising that he is going to teach his children to have faith in God. And why? Because God is so faithful. Are you praying with children? Are you exemplifying uh, the priority of God? Uh, what are they picking up from you? But now that's a tough question, I know, but it's a really necessary question because it isn't a secret that Hezekiah didn't pass on the faithfulness of God to the next generation because his son Manasseh was one of the worst kings ever to rule over Judah. Somebody who led the whole nation into idolatry and not following God and even burns one of his own children to one of these false gods in idol worship. That's horrific. Hezekiah didn't follow through on verse 19. But will you? Will your children pick up on passion and service and faithfulness? Or will they pick up on lukewarmness and laziness and inconsistency? Well, then in verse 20, there was to be communal devotion. And so it says, we will play my music on stringed instruments all the days of our lives. Now, that's daily worship and joining with others for worship as well. Uh, yeah, it's another one of those amazing verses, which I love, that remind me that, yes, technically you can be a Christian and not go to church, but it isn't the ideal it's not what God would hope for you as part of the body, part of the family. You won't be fulfilled. Um, praise the Lord, we get to be together as a church again with live musicians. But you'll notice, of course, that it's only stringed instruments. And that's because wind instruments are only allowed on level one, which hopefully we'll go into mid-June when we come out of these COVID restrictions more and more. Well, this communal devotion plays on into verse 21 and 22, where we find that once Hezekiah has this outward sign of healing, he'll be able to join others in worshipping God and going up to the house of the Lord. Now, he couldn't go to the house of the Lord when he's ill. And we can't, of course, either if we're showing signs of COVID. But when he was healthy, when he was healed, when he was safe, he would join others. That's a great example to us, isn't it? Amazing words, amazing prayer from one of the best kings that there was in Judah. But 
Chapter 39 does not make for good reading. Let's read about the decline. Let's read 39. At that time, Merodach Baladan and the son, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he'd been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly. And he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his whole armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And from where did they come to you? Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come after you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, There will be peace and security in my days. Hezekiah has just had two amazing answers to prayer. A sign and a healing. And then this Babylonian delegation comes along um, because they want to give this gift because they've heard that he's got better. Now, the inference, of course, of this is that they want an alliance. They're coming here because they want a friend in Judah because they're rebelling against Assyria and they want others to join in that. And now that Hezekiah is better, well, he seems to be very flattered by this. And so he goes beyond the natural response of receiving a gift. And he goes and he shows off and he shows all the wealth and he shows all of the strength and the armory. Now, that might have seemed like a good idea at the time, but you would only show those kind of things off to people that you wanted to be your friends. You wanted to have an alliance with against a superpower like Assyria. Enter Isaiah. You'll notice that Hezekiah doesn't answer that first question about what they said to him. Uh, but he tells Isaiah everything else, it seems, and so the judgment is given. You might be proud of all of this wealth, some of which has been stored up by your ancestors and your strength, but all of this stuff that you're so proud of, it's going to go to Babylon. And even some of your own descendants, Hezekiah, their kings that are coming after you, they are going to be taken off to that land as well to be servants. And then comes probably, well, the most disappointing verse of, verse of all. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, for he thought there will be peace and security in my days. What he's saying is, at least it won't happen while I'm alive. I'm all right. What a sickening response. There are two things that I really want to bring out from these two chapters as we wrap up our talk time today. Firstly, there's such a contrast between these chapters. And the contrast comes from the pressure. Notice how Hezekiah's reaction to disaster is straight to prayer. Enough to write it down um, so that we would have this recorded for us thousands of years later. And we might probably say that when things are utterly terrible, that is when we always depend on God more. We pray more, we read our Bibles more. There's nothing like difficulty to humble us and get our focus sorted. A little like the first lockdown, when everyone was talking about the things that mattered and there was a huge surge in interest in what the, even the living room had to say, Christians had to say. But then come easy times, relaxed times, times when your trust fades. It's easy to forget God when, when the going's so good. Could you or I be falling into that trap? Someone I was reading um, just in preparation for this said, trust in God must become a way of life, not just a talisman rubbed at critical moments. 
Don't let the ease of lockdown make you lazy and complacent. And the second point is this, and with this I'm going to finish. Hezekiah is one of the best kings. And as the, the book of Second Kings tells us, our hope in humanity cannot lie in earthly rulers. God himself is our only hope. And that is why this chapter sets us up so incredibly for the chapters to come. And you're going to know loads from these chapters that are coming up. It's such a, a nice section to get us ready to have disappointment in what Hezekiah is and to think about Emmanuel, to think about how God has this incredible king that is coming, this God with us. He's already been described so far as the root. He's been described as the branch. He's going to be described as a servant. That's going to be the title given to him in chapters coming up. Um, this descendant of King David, as Hezekiah was, who is Jesus. Jesus is the one who can take our scarlet sins and make them white as snow, who has the government on his shoulder and uphold his kingdom with justice and with righteousness. Those are amazing things to take away today. That's where our trust needs to be all the time. So let's pray right now, shall we? Lord, thank you. Thank you once again for amazing chapters, amazing words to push us, to challenge us, and Lord, to inspire us. Lord, you are our hope. And so we really pray for everybody listening online that you will help us to look past governments and everybody and look to you. Lord, look to you, not just in the hard times, but all the time. Lord, that you would be our strength and our shield. Lord, we thank you that you work in our lives and we pray that you would have your way in us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for listening and see you again soon.